Uh, do so now. We'll give you a few minutes to do this before we start recording. Please stop. Can, do you want to be seen, or do you mind? No, I don't mind. Do you like it on? Yeah. Anthony, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So hopefully people have had the opportunity to, to go anonymous if they wanted to. So now I'm delighted to welcome Anthony Simpson, who is presenting the talk tonight. Anthony has an MSc in Renewable Energy and Sustainability, has worked for a number of years in the fields of both solar energy and the grid integration of electric vehicles and has co-led a company's environmental program leading to a listing in the Sunday Times greenest companies. Anthony will be presenting surprising research on the range of impacts of our food choices. The purpose of this talk is to improve the quality of our conversations about individual and collective environmental action, and specifically about how we can adjust our food choices towards a net zero carbon society. So over to Anthony. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, good, okay. So yeah, thank you very much for, for inviting me and um, I've been involved, I guess, in climate change um, campaigning for about 15 years. And this was after um, starting to attend uh, some talks in, at Oxford University by climate scientists. And I was astonished by what I was hearing because this just wasn't something that was in the public domain and wasn't something that was being discussed. Um, and that then led to me changing my career and retraining and doing a master's and just be becoming, I guess, an independent researcher into trying to understand there is a lot of information about what we can do that people readily share with each other day to day on social media. Um, but the question is, are we doing the right things and are we focusing on the right things? And uh, for many years, I, I kind of caught odd headlines about food, about food waste, about food miles. Um, and, you know, should we reduce a, a little bit of meat and, and these types of things came up. And then it was probably about three years ago uh, when, again, I saw a fairly sort of important talk that I decided to do more of a deep dive on the subject. And I've, I've collated about 300 sources uh, of government reports, uh, scientific reports, um, and the, what I'd like to present today is a summary of, of some of those findings. And I think that some of, some of this is not, in, is not understood, is not very clear. And I think that many, if not the majority of environmental organizations are not focusing necessarily on the most important aspects. Um, it's an interesting time. We've obviously got um, Extinction Rebellion are, are back out campaigning to raise the, the profile um, of this and um, and I greatly support them. Anything to raise the priority of what is probably one of the least uh, or, or under focused area um, I, needs to, the intention to be brought to the subject. If I just share my screen. So these are, I think you've, you may have already seen some of the areas that I wanted to cover today. So can, can, there's, there's what, nearly 8 billion people now on, on the planet. Can we, can we feed more people? Can we feed 10 billion people? And are we actually doing a very good job of feeding ourselves today? Um, are food miles, how important are they? Um, what, is a low carbon uh, diet healthy for us? And what are the other impacts that, that food brings? And what about food waste? So those are some of the examples. 
Um, I think, that, again, this is a bit of a reminder. So um, there's been a lot of impacts that we now are really becoming quite apparent across the world. Uh, last year, um, we obviously saw the huge fires across Australia. We've seen fires uh, on an unprecedented scale in the Arctic Circle of all places. We've seen nearly 40 degrees centigrade recently in Siberia. We've seen right today, the three of the four biggest wildfires in recorded history in California are burning. And this is what you see on the screen at the moment. There is no solar energy in California today because the smoke is blocking out the sky. Um, and there are many other things that are happening, some of which I will touch on today. Um, but it really is quite a big deal that the, the world is now changing. It, it, I, I was born in the 70s. We, we will never experience those conditions again. It, that, that's gone forever. The question is, um, the changes are accelerating. The question is, can we act together to, to stop to stop things from getting worse and worse and worse? Can we stop? Can we get lots of other benefits from, from changing our behavior and then gradually try to undo some of the damage by starting to draw down some of the CO2 in the atmosphere? So it's a, it's a lot, it's a tall order, but it's possible. Uh, what we need is intelligent conversations, intelligent information and the act uh, and the will to act. And, and that, that involves all of us. The first thing I wanted to show you, so just, just to make you aware, at the end, I'm going to give you a link for a, a short feedback form, which I would love you to fill in, please, to help me improve the talk for other people. Um, if you fill that form in, I will send you a copy of the slides just to save you having to write things down. I, I think, as I say, it's being recorded as well. Every single slide that I present today is sourced on the slide. So you will, you will see it very clearly. And um, as I say, if you, you can get a copy of the slides and certainly I would encourage you to independently review some of this information. You don't need to take my word for it. I'm presenting their fantastic research and work that unfortunately is not getting out to you in a way in which it should. And um, as I say, please, please try to think about getting reading some of these reports, even just the executive summaries, but try and get a bit of a feel for, for, for what the scientists are saying directly. Don't take someone's word for it on social media. Try and get beyond that. Um, and you will be you will just find an array of very, very interesting information out there. So the Eat Lancet Commission, their task was can we can we healthily can we feed 10 billion people and remain within multiple planetary boundaries, which is not just about carbon dioxide, but it's also about other um, strains that we're putting on the planet in terms of water and uh, ocean dead zones, acidification, um, a whole range of other aspects. They brought in 37 uh, world experts from, from a whole range of different fields to see if they could do this. Uh, their summary at the start was humanity is facing a huge crisis in terms of climate, human health and, and well-being. And what they discovered um, was that two billion people lacked the nutrients, micronutrients that they required. And more than two billion adults in the world are overweight or obese. And they, uh, Professor Willett from Harvard University said the majority of the world's population is suboptimally malnourished of, of either too much or too little of the right foods. It's hard to imagine how we could have created a more dysfunctional system. So not a great starting point. And this was the diet they came up with. It was called the planetary health diet. And they say, as well as this diet, keeping the world of 10 billion people within planetary boundaries, it would save 11 million lives per year in improved health outcomes. And one of the things to, to, to highlight on the right hand side of this, so the left hand side in green is fruit and vegetables. The yellow section here is whole grains. Um, the, 
there's a couple of blue lines that are quite small to see, this small slice. The blue section is dairy and the red section is animal sourced protein. It's a very, very small amount. Um, just, and what they say is 6% of the weight of the food we eat in grams, um, no more than 6% would come from beef, lamb, pork, chicken, eggs, or fish. At the moment in Europe and Asia, we are many, many times over that for things like red meat. So one of the things, obviously, that then a lot of people say is, well, hang on though, I need, I need protein, I need enough protein, and um, if I'm going to massively reduce my meat to virtually nothing, well, how's that going to work? Um, and we need about 44 grams of protein per day um, to, to be healthy. At the moment, we get 49 grams of protein per day from plants. This is an average for the globe. And we get an additional 32 from meat. So even if you took away the amount of protein we get from meat, um, we already on average would, and, and the fact is you would probably replace some of that with more vegetables and fruit and other things that would, would still have protein in. Um, and you would find that that you'd have significantly more. Now, then that leads to another question that some people have said to me, which is, ah, but protein from plants isn't the same as uh, protein from animals, is it? Um, so uh, I got a book um, who, by Dr. Katz. He is the Director of Preventative Disease at Yale University. And he wrote a book called The Truth About Food. It looks like I've copied, copied his, his name there, doesn't it? Sorry about that, Dr. Katz. But anyway, uh, what he said was, the conventional wisdom has long been that animal foods provide complete protein that we're unable to get from plants. The conventional wisdom is wrong. So again, don't take my word for it if you don't want to. He, he is an absolute expert in this field. And, um, and you will find that replicated across the research. We, we don't need to eat meat in order to get um, extremely good protein for us. Um, many of you may know Mike Berners-Lee, brother of Tim Berners-Lee, Tim who, who, who was one of the people who helped to create the internet. And Mike Berners-Lee is an extremely experienced academic professor at Lancaster University. He's written many books and done lots of excellent talks on YouTube about the carbon footprint of just about everything. In fact, his book, How Bad Are Bananas, which he wrote, he, he released 10 years ago, he's actually updated and I received my copy today via ebook. It's just out. So if you do buy a copy of that book, make sure you buy the new 2020 version and not the one from 10 years ago. Anyway, in a, a book he wrote a year ago uh, called There's No Planet B, um, he, he does quite an interesting thing to, to, to explain a little bit about where calories are lost. Now, this is quite interesting because many people, again, say, or, or many environmental groups focus on food waste, you know, quite reasonably, you know, we, because we do waste food. We do put it sometimes in the bin. We do sometimes put it in the bin too quickly. Um, and that, that creates additional waste and could, could additional unnecessary emissions and impacts. But let's just have a little look at what Mike Berners-Lee's data effectively says. So I've got two columns in front. The left-hand column is the average diet. In the, it's, it's actually the average diet in the world. And on the right-hand column is to show you how it compares to a plant-based diet. So what this first, the first chunks say that, that we need about 2,350 calories um, to live healthily. He said at the moment on average in the world, and there are lots of uh, people who are above and below average, but in average, we eat an extra 178 calories that we, we don't actually need, excess calories. Then on average, there are about 261 calories that are as a result of food waste. Now this does confuse some people. And the reason is, is, in some parts of the world, uh, food waste is uh, in the home is much lower and it's often where food is more scarce and people are extremely careful and they eat 
as much as they possibly can. And it tends to be in the, the, the more developed and well-off countries that throw more of their food away at home. They stack it in the fridge and often don't get around to eating it and, and perhaps aren't so, uh, you know, it's, it's not as crucial if they don't eat it. Um, and then actually what you find is that some of the losses in the system are the other way round for the transportation. So in, in, in richer countries, the, to get the food to you, the waste losses are often less because of refrigeration of lorries and the quality of, of, of the transportation infrastructure. Whereas in poorer countries, um, that might be more haphazard. A lot of it may not have refrigeration and therefore a lot of the food is, is lost before it actually reaches the consumer. Um, but let's let's look at this really fascinating diagram. So then other losses uh, in the system are almost a thousand calories. And there's one other thing that's missing. And that is that whilst many of us focus in on this food waste, which is about 260 calories per person, these are the losses in the system um, from animal agriculture. So what this says is an average diet in the world at the moment, 9,000 calories per person are, are, are consumed to feed us. So, um, so of that, so of that five, and that's because we repeatedly feed animals so that at some point in time in the future, we will eat them once. And effectively what that red bar is showing you is that inefficiency in the process that that now some people say to me, oh, well, hang on. What about the fact that um, many of those animals will be eating grass and or on 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 parts of land that you cannot um, grow crops for human consumption. Now, of that 5000, less than two thirds um, are on that kind of land, um, but a third of those are crops that are perfectly um, edible for humans and, and, could, and that land could be used. And you can see by the bars we've got in front of us, we don't need that. We don't need anything like that amount of, of land um, to feed us because we've already got um, more than enough calories coming into our system. So um, I, shall, I shall move on. So Mike Berners-Lee's book that came out uh, as I say this week and and you can get it for about four pounds uh, as an ebook uh, today um, so he 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 is just showing you on here if you wanted to get he's rounded it up to 50 grams of protein in a day what method what what are the co2 emissions associated with different forms of protein and you can see at the top pulses uh, soya milk ground nuts nuts and peas to provide the the, the, the the protein we would need are exceedingly low. Um, and then in the middle, you've got fish, eggs, milk, chicken, and pork, which are multiple times greater. And then you move into a different phase again in terms of king prawns, lamb, beef, and then and some forms of beef, uh, which, which have a huge impact. In, um, so again, if you look at Mike Berners-Lee, if you want to understand a bit more detail about that, um, there's this book and also another one that are well worth a look, which, which have lots of different food types. So this photo that I've, I've taken this idea from uh, Dr. Joseph Poor from the University of Oxford, and uh, he's done some extremely important research as part of a team. Um, they analysed data from 40,000 farms across the world um, which represented, I think, nearly 90% of the, the food that we eat. And, and it was, a, it, 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 I understand, is the most thorough and comprehensive uh, environmental footprinting exercise that's been done. Um, and this is one of the things that, that he, he wanted to highlight. So on the screen, you've got, this is actually a, a satellite picture of a livestock farm. Oh. And it's been, you can see, almost cut out of the forest. So you can see a square has almost been identified for this purpose to, to, to take forest down in order to produce uh, or create a livestock farm. 
And what this now zoomed out again shows you is it's not the only block. There's lots of blocks all round. And it runs to millions, to millions of farms that have now been created. And, and you see a lot of faded areas now on this map, huge parts that have been carved out of the Amazon rainforest and other South American rainforests. And in Dr. Paul's words, simply because we prefer the taste of animal protein over plant protein, we, we effectively are carving these millions of farms from the rainforest. 17%, about a sixth of the Amazon rainforest has gone. And Professor Nobra, um, a very well-respected um, climate scientist, said in a recent scientific paper called Amazon Tipping Point, we believe um, negative synergies between deforestation, climate change, and the widespread use of fire um, indicate a tipping point for the Amazon system to flip from non-forest ecosystem at 20 to 25% deforestation. What he's saying here, and again, you can go and read it for yourself, is we're at 17% as gone, 20% of the Amazon is now emitting more carbon than it's absorbing, which is extraordinary. If we reach a point, and they don't know precisely when it's gonna be, but we're getting close between 20 and 25% of the Amazon deforested, it will not be able to retain enough moisture to sustain itself. And, and we will see the irreversible collapse of the Amazon rainforest. And just to give you an idea, in um, uh, periodically over, hundreds of thousands of years, um, the, the climate changes and ice sheets come down and go recede uh, 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 from, from the poles. And, and the area that's least affected is, is, is this area in the middle that where you've got rainforest near the equator. It's, and as a result, that's why you have the most biodiversity because these forests have been there the longest. So in the Canada, in the, in the huge boreal forests of Canada, um, there's about 20 different species of trees. You could go into an area of the Amazon of just a few miles and there would be more than 1,000 species of trees and obviously all manner of other different creatures and, um, that live there. The, 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 the thought that we are so close and I don't think most people appreciate, we do hear about you know, ex-football pitches being destroyed, um, but it's being destroyed to make room for livestock. So the land is being um, cleared to make room for the animals. And then many people say, oh, but hang on, what about soya? So m much of it is for soya crops. And that's true, um, soya crops to feed the animals. So the FCRN, it's called the Food Climate Research Network, who, who are in, it, who have links, uh, again, it, Oxford University, their in, Environmental Change Institute is part of this, uh, running this network. So they said in some research, and this is 2019, 90% of soya consumed in the UK is fed to livestock animals. So when people say, you know, so, soya is bad for you, well, chances are meat eaters are effectively responsible for, for a greater amount of that soya being consumed. Um, most is imported from South America. Only 20 to 30 percent has been certified that is not come from recently cleared lands. Now that doesn't mean the other 70 to 80 percent has come from cleared lands, but what it means is we don't know. We're at the mercy of the international supply chain and, and there's not enough information to say accurately. Um, an independent or an organization, a supply chain transparency initiative called TRAES found that UK imports are associated with considerable land clearing in Brazil. And this is, sorry, this is just a quote from the World Wildlife Fund who say that 90% of the soya we eat is embedded in fish, eggs, meat and dairy. So I'm now gonna show you some research from uh, Harvard University and New York University um, called two academics called 
uh, Helen Harwatt and Matthew Hayek. And they released, it's been a really busy week this week, they released a report about two days ago, which I'm going to show you in a second, the highlight from that. But what they do um, is a lot of people focus on the emissions of food. What are the carbon emissions associated? And we think about what's going on on the farm. But often what's missing from that conversation is what could we do with that land if we didn't use it for a particular purpose? And so let's have a, th th this paper, that, uh, which is a really brilliant, short, interesting report just about the UK uh, in 2019, um, gives a really interesting analysis of the United Kingdom. So what this graph shows you is that 35% of all of the UK land is for livestock. 13% of the UK land is for the crops to feed the livestock. So half of the UK effectively, we, we give over to animal agriculture. 11% of the UK is for crops we feed directly to humans. Uh, then we've got 12% of the UK are woodlands. Now this is really important because land and the food we eat are intrinsically linked and are intrinsically in key in terms of climate change because one of the major ways in which we draw down carbon emissions is through forests. Now the average um, the average country in Europe has 35% forest cover. Some, some Scandinavian countries are fortunate to be 65, 70%. Uh, the UK at 12% is pretty much bottom of the pile. And the question is, well, what, that, that, that shows you effectively that on a local scale, what impact livestock can have on those forests that have been eroded over the years. But it's, that's not the end of the story. In addition to the land here, an area the size of the UK is, um, is used abroad for us to eat. So we use two thirds of the UK plus another, an entire country the size of the UK in area abroad. And as we mentioned earlier, some of that is in Brazil and, and other, uh, other countries like that. Um, what, what, what these academics analysed was in, they, they, they looked at different scenarios of us changing our diets and they said if, if we reforested the area that is currently used for livestock, the 35%, and we actually ate directly the crops from the livestock, uh, 13%, effectively we could be self-sufficient for food. Now, it's not quite as simple as that because obviously we can't grow, you know, things like bananas and things. And there would, we would clearly want to trade with other countries. But what we would be doing is dramatically reducing the amount of land here and abroad that we would require to feed ourselves and sustain ourselves when we've got a growing population. And we also now have risks that some uh, areas of agriculture are, are becoming unusable, partly due to the changes in our climate that are happening with um, so th these people are really important and then a couple of days ago they, re they released another report uh, which was on a global scale and this absolutely blew my mind and I will explain why so this is the report it's called the carbon opportunity cost of animal sourced food production on land so it's calculating how much carbon emissions could we absorb if we, we, we instead of using the land for animal agriculture, and we still had plenty of land to grow plant-based and cereals, things like that, that, that could healthily feed us. So that was all accounted for. That, um, what would be the impact in terms of carbon emissions? Now, what it says here is, um, here we map the magnitude of this opportunity and find that shifts in global food production to plant-based diets by 2050 could lead to sequestration, which is the carbon absorption, of 300 to 550 gigatons of CO2. Now, for many people, that number doesn't really make any sense. A giga is a billion, by the way. 
um, but but it's it's just a very big number. How how do we make sense of that? Well, here's the key thing: at the moment, global human greenhouse gas emissions are 40 gigatons of CO2 per annum. Remember, the world is trying to get to net zero. Well, many countries are, but it's it, it, we're trying to get to net zero by 2050. So the next 20, 30 years, we're really trying to get from 40 to zero and then to go negative. So if that was a linear line, if we went from 40 to zero over 30 years, I think that would work out to 600 gigatons that we would consume of carbon emissions. This is saying that if we were to change our diets, a huge proportion of that can be absorbed by us um, allowing natural ecosystems to re-establish themselves and to start drawing that carbon back into the ground and back into the trees and back into the, the, the other things. Um, and this has enormous implications for our chances of, of what, at what point we are going to stop the, the planet from warming any further. And remember, we can, only, we can only start to make any difference to reducing the temperature by actually drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. So this is an enormous tool in the, in the tool bag. And for anyone not to take notice of this is, 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 is not looking at the big picture. This is really important research. And I hope um, you will go away and you'll look at these two papers and you will talk about it. And then just a little reminder. So a report by a 2018 report by uh, Yin and Baron and team they, they did an assessment called bio distribu uh, biomass distribution of the earth and they effectively said what was the mass or weight of, of all of the creatures in the world and what they discovered is that livestock now outnumbers wild mammals 15 to 1. Wild mammals is this small section of orange here, the blue bit here are, are humans and then here we have livestock. So for some people, and many people think, oh, we can't affect the climate, you know, it's huge. We have and we are. For livestock to be outnumbering wild mammals 15 to 1 across the globe is absolutely astonishing. And there are implications for that. So another thing that distracted me today, it's been a real problem week. Today, this report was released. The, uh, the World Wildlife Living Planet Report. And I have a slide on their previous report, 2018. And one of the things that it said was that since the 70s, when I was born, the number of um, mammals has reduced by 60%, 60% fewer in the world. What this report said two years later, so World Wildlife Fund sends SOS for nature as scientists warn that wildlife is in free fall. We've now gone from to 68% average drop in global wildlife populations since the 1970s, 68%. What are we gonna see in another two years and another five years? It really is in free fall. Um, and what it says here, Nature is being destroyed by humans at a rate never seen before, and this catastrophic decline is showing no signs of slowing. The, the study says in, intensive agriculture, deforestation, and the conversion of wild spaces into farmland are among the main causes of nature loss, whilst overfishing is wreaking havoc with marine life. So again, another report, you can go and print that or sorry, you can go and read that on their website. It's a very interesting summary and, and it will explain to you. So what it says is I think that the numbers in, in parts of South America, uh, the, the, the wildlife populations have dropped, dropped more than 90% uh, and it will give you a bit of a picture regionally across the world. So I don't know, I think this stuff's really important. I really do. This, nobody talks about things like this, not really. It's not something that, that gets our everyday attention when, you know, when we're just rubbing along and we're doing things in our day-to-day -day life. But, you know, it is, it's a completely different world to when I, I was born in the 1970s that, that we now have today. And what's, what's gonna be left in 20 or 30 years? 
the rate we're going. And, and the food system is one of the biggest things driving this. It's certainly the leading cause of deforestation. And this is just a quick reminder, again, from Professor Mike Berners-Lee, um, of how steep we now need to cut our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and again, some people say to me, you know, what, why, how about suggesting that people just, you know, cut down one meal a week? Well, you can, but maybe you should, just, you know, 20 years ago, that might have worked. But what this shows is the, the steepness of which we need to cut our emissions based on the date we start doing it. And it showed if we stopped in around 20, two, 2000, if we started reducing our emissions, it would be quite a gradual curve. It's now 2020 and the emissions have kept rising. As I mentioned, we're up to 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. Look how steep that cup is, that, 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 that depletion is for us to have any sensible kind of climate for our future, for our grandchildren and children, and also for ourselves in 20, 30 years time. So this is remarkably steep. And I would say the time, um, David McKay, who he sadly passed away several years ago, he wrote, um, he was a chief scientific officer for the government and he was a, a brilliant mathematician, Cambridge academic, and he wrote a book called Sustainability Without the Hot Air and a very mathematical person who explained all the different aspects of sustainability in number form that we could, we could understand. And he, I went to about three of his talks um, and, and the thing that he kept repeating was, he said, I often hear people talk about we all need to do our bit. He said, if we all do our bit, we fail. We have to do our lot now, and we really do. We've got to get from, in the UK, we're at about 13 tonnes of CO2 per person per year. And we've got to get that, we've effectively to zero. And the, re the way we get it, to, we won't actually get it to zero, but what we do need to do is allow trees and forests and things to absorb possibly one tonne of that, or maybe a bit more, but we need to cut our emissions very dramatically. It will be done through renewable energy, will pay a big part, but, but, but the food system at the moment is on track to, to, to be responsible for more emissions than fossil fuels um, on the trajectories that we're going at the moment. And so it needs to change. We've got to change, we've got to divert, and we, we've got to come off, um, you know, we've got to try and get on this line up here. So food is responsible for 26% or around a quarter of global CO2 emissions, which is more um, than the entire transport sector, for example, all planes, all, all cars. Um, so it is an absolutely massive contributor to our CO2 emissions. What this shows you is some research from a team called by Sandstrom in 2018. And this is a colour code of um, uh, European countries um, carbon emissions from food. Every line on this is a country and what, what, what you will find is the red um, bars are from dairy. So this is the CO2 emissions that we eat. The red bars are dairy. The orange bars are the animal produce. And then the tiny bits at the end are everything else. Fruit, vegetables, grains, cereals. So 83% of our greenhouse gas emissions from the food we eat come from animal produce and that's and, and that's something that we can directly influence it's not one of those things that we have to go to politicians and ask to do on our behalf we can make that decision three times a day when we eat and when we think about it um, and there are some great resources now available to help you make good decisions about what are lower carbon options um, and again, this shows you um, the greenhouse gas emissions, again, from different types of food. And you've got beef as the highest, lamb almost as high. And then you've got different things, shrimp, cheese, pork, chicken, eggs. And then towards the bottom, you've got things like tofu, beans, peas, nuts that are extremely low in terms of their emissions. This site, Our World in Data, 
if you just want some images like this and summaries, they put an enormous amount of research on there, a lot of which comes from some of the reports I'm showing you today. And they, they are based, again, they are academics from Oxford University who run this. So it's, it's a great website and it doesn't just cover food, it covers all, all interesting things that are manner of topics, environmental and also uh, other. What we're still learning about is what the carbon footprint is of things like alternatives. So uh, things like um, there are now burgers being created that for those who, who really like burgers, that many people cannot taste the difference. Things like the Impossible Burger and Beyond, Beyond Beef and there's Miami Burger. Um, the UK government said that they still need to do more research to understand the impact of those burgers and it varies in terms of some people may say it's five to ten times lower than a beef burger the, the uk climate change committee said they think it might be 25 times whether it's five times ten times or 25 times though what it does say is it's it's a dramatic difference so if you if you i, I would again i would if, if you really miss a burger and you'd find that really difficult to give up i would really encourage you they're not like the veggie burgers from 20 years ago the chalky things that used to break up in your hand there are now burgers there that people cannot taste the difference and I would in, I'd encourage you to find out and, and, and have a go um, because it will make a dramatic difference in terms of the impact that you're having. I'm going to rush past this because I'm conscious of time. Um, food is very complicated. There are lots and lots of different um, compromises often. So some things, um, so so for example if you eat less meat you will your your greenhouse gas emissions will almost inevitably fall and your land use will automatically fall but there are different situations and different cases where things are actually contradict each other um, and in the detail so in terms of small practices so you might find that one one situation um, requires more water in another situation, it might cause more acidification, a, a particular farming method. And therefore, sometimes what the re farmers need to de make decisions based on what's appropriate for their region. So, for instance, in the Mississippi, there is a huge problem with uh, eutrophication. So you might try to grow crops that are not going to add to that problem. In, in uh, California or Australia or somewhere else, it might be water is much more precious and therefore um, and there is a lot of detail behind this analysis, um, but yeah, I think it's probably a bit too much to go through right now. Uh, one thing that, quick, that that comes up is milk, so um, dairy milk, and uh, th this is just a brief summary of the different impacts of dairy milk versus some alternative plant milks, rice, soy, oat, almond, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions land use and water use. And it's partly due to research like this that I predominantly would drink oat milk and soy milk because they've got the lowest emissions and land use and water use, and therefore are likely to have the lowest impact. Again, people often say, well, almonds are much worse. Well, you know, you can see here, there will be examples, there will be variability from farm to farm and product to product, but overall this uses less water and dramatically less land and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but as I say, soy and oat are definitely the lowest of all. So what about food miles? Where, how do they come into that? Well, Again, this is part of the, the research that uh, Poor and Nemechek did for 2018, the analysis of 40,000 farms. And what they, what's good here is they're showing you different foods um, across the left-hand side, and, and they're showing you where the emissions come from for that food. Um, there is a tiny bar at the end in red, which you will not be able to see on all of these bars virtually, um, that is transport emissions for food. Again, this is really important because a lot of people spend a lot of time focusing on this. 
about 7% of CO2 emissions in the food we eat comes from transportation. Um, one of the key things to understand is we're not saying obviously that you shouldn't eating seasonally is really good eating locally where you can it, it, it sure it's it's the positive thing to do but it's really not that big a deal in terms of the, the environmental footprint as a whole what is important is that we try to avoid air freighted food because if you um shipping something from australia or Africa on a boat has incredibly small emissions, probably significantly less perhaps for that item than you driving five or six miles to go and get it yourself. That you would have used more emissions in the diesel petrol than, than it than would have been taken up by shipping it around the world remarkably. But um, air emissions are diff different. And now most, most foods are, are not shipped by air. So 0.16% of food miles globally come from air freight. However, it is something in the West that we're likely to be more exposed to. Um, so the thing to look out for is to try to avoid um, perishable out of season foods. So if you're buying berries that are, are completely out of season for the UK, um, there is every chance that, and, and it comes from a country the other side of the world, there is a chance that be, um, to get it to you in that, in that state for you to eat, that it could have been air freighted. One of the really important things is that we need to ask our politicians to label food. It should be really clear because we can't tell if a food's been air freighted and we should be able to, as well as having carbon footprinting on food, which would be invaluable for us to make decisions at the supermarket but but as a starting point knowing if it's air freighted would make a big difference so briefly it's worth a quick word about fish so one of the amazing things i learned about fish and this also comes from the our world um in data website uh from the world bank um what this shows is two lines of growth in consumption of fish the red line is what we capture at, at sea. The blue line that is now higher up here it are the um, factory farming of fish, which we now start to see. Um, so more than half the fish that we now consume is factory farmed. It's not, it's not shipped. So one thing that many environmental groups do talk about is the plastic in the ocean. And, and what's worth mentioning is more than half of the plastic or macro, the large pieces of plastic, more than half the large pieces of plastic in the ocean come from the fishing industry. So it, it, if you're concerned about plastic waste, then fish is one key part or, or key risk, um, impact that you can help reduce. As Dr. Poor said now, many of the factory farm fish um, produce more um, methane than beef do um, from, from the emissions often from their waste. Um, it can't decompose in the presence of oxygen because it's in the water and instead it's emitted as methane. And methane um, is about 300 times more powerful um, than, than CO2. And just an interesting fact for you, in Scotland, the factory farming of fish or factory farmed fish now produce more than three times as much feces as humans. Um, so again, the, the serious point here, here is think about the environmental impact that that has near, near where those um, contained fish are, that there will, they will be that, that waste will be seeping into the waterways and will be having a, de um, a detrimental effect, not just the methane emissions, but in terms of water quality. So what Paul and Nemechek effectively, uh, I guess the summary of some of their information was animal, animal agriculture gives us 18% of our calories, but 83% of our land use is what it, it takes up. So 
just to put that in perspective, what that means is the other 82% of calories we eat come from 17% of the land. What that means is 20 times as much land is used for the calories you consume from animals than the, than the calories you, you consume from everything else. Um, animal agriculture, as well as only producing 18% of our calories globally, is also responsible for way over half of the greenhouse gas emissions from food, way over half the water pollution, the air pollution, and is responsible for a disproportionate amount of fresh water consumption relative to calories. So one of the things that Poor and Nemechek analysed in, in their analysis of these 40,000 farms was, well, what, what would happen if we all consumed plant-based diets? And he said that eutrophication, which means ocean dead zones and dead zones that are starting to emerge in some freshwater systems um, due to too many nutrients from animal agriculture leaching into the water, would reduce by about 40%. He said that the land use would reduce by 75%. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So 75%, we would we'd need 75% less land uh, if we all ate plant-based. Um, and again, this thing of, well, hang on, wouldn't we need more land for crops? And the answer is no, because so many of the crops that we grow on arable land are fed to animals, um, we would even see a reduction in the arable la crop land by 20% um, as a result. And this is what 75% reduction in land space looks like if we all followed a plant-based diet. That's bigger than the continent of Africa and, and often maps are actually not very proportionate in the way in which they view. So Africa is, is actually bigger than, than it may appear. And what this shows is it's bigger than China, India, the United States, Eastern Europe, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, Japan put together and the UK. So just again, if you go back now and, and link that back to the research from Harwat and Hayek about how we could save three to 500 billion tons of CO2 by repurposing this land, you can see that the, 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 they're researching this stuff independently, but, but they're coming to the similar conclusion. There's an enormous amount of land and we're doing completely the opposite. Not only are we using all this land, we're using more and more of it and we are destroying more and more of what is left of our forests accordingly. In the UK, um, specifically, they estimated that, that we would cut our emissions by two and a half to three tonnes if we went to a plant-based diet, but that was half, half of that benefit would come from a direct reduction in emissions from the food you eat. The other half is the potential emissions that could be absorbed if the land that was used for the animal produce you no longer need was, was effectively now, now put back to wild ecosystems to emerge and, and start drawing carbon in. I think I've covered most of these things. So, and then, uh, you know, I, often what people say is, you know, always every environmental talk talks about well, what, what about China? Well, uh, China are probably having the most serious conversations about reducing meat. And they're talking about, they're consulting about targeting a 50% cut in meat consumption um, by, I think that's by 20, is it by 2040? Um, sorry, no, it is, it says on here, it says 2030. That's by far the most ambitious I've seen any country even considering. The UK, we don't have any such targets. The Climate Change Committee that advises this parliament has got in very small writing in their reports about, well, perhaps we could reduce meat by 20% in 30 years. Um, what we're relying on is this, this is partly why a lot of the net zero uh, scenarios that we have rely on negative emissions technologies that have never been fully proven. They may work and they're all being researched like carbon capture and storage. And many of those things will gradually start to come in. Um, but they're not things we, we necessarily can do today and things that we can do at scale. And it's a complete gamble. Um, so for whatever reason, this is deemed to be too sensitive to talk about. People don't want to talk about it. You know, they don't want to be 
they feel like they're interfering somehow although you know obviously we accept we have to wear a seat belt and that's not interfering some people did think it was interfering before that came into effect when we were asked people not to smoke many people thought in pubs and bars many people thought that was interfering but we did it we got used to it and most people have benefited in terms of their health um this is one that needs it simply needs all of our political parties and all of us to embrace and say that's the research that's the science it's an obvious and important solution um are we simply going to ignore it or are we going to try and reduce the amount of animal produce we we eat over the next um 20 years gradually or can we be more ambitious than that because we know we've got to now very steeply reduce our emissions Lastly, what I haven't really talked about today is about animal sentience and the fact that we, I mentioned earlier, 15 times as many animals are now alive as livestock than as wild animals. Um, and we, we, we are um, killing over 70 billion sentient animals a year and it, between one and two trillion fish, all of which are, are sentient, they feel pain. Um, and it, it's simply, what changed for me is that I always thought we had to eat animals and therefore it wasn't something I really needed to consider because it wasn't a choice. But now I know from reading the science that I actually that, 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 that's not the case, that, that we, we can adapt our diet. There's some fantastic resources to help guide us in terms of how to adapt our diet. Um, and, and also there are one or two supplements that are useful to take. And some people say, oh, well, I don't need to have supplements if I eat animals. But that's often not because, um, not because the animals that you eat produce those vitamins. It's because they're fed the supplements. So again, it's one of those things that that it's inefficient in terms of the process where you could take something that gives one or two vitamins and and, and minerals um, rather than some of those things be fed to an animal. Um, so. I wanted to recommend a very readable book. It takes you just over an hour to read uh, called Eat Like You Care by Professor Francioni, who was the first uh, law professor of animal rights in, in the US. And it's a fascinating read and just shows, um, it, it just will help you understand the ethics of, of, of how we've almost, for whatever reason, we've managed to completely separate in our mind the life of a dog versus the life of a cow versus the life of a pig. Um, completely arbitrarily um, and this is the book that someone waved around at the start this book came out on Saturday inspired by David McKay who who wrote um, sustainable energy without the hot air this is food and climate change without the hot air by Professor Sarah Bridal it's free you can get it from Amazon um, now if you want to um, and it's very detailed and to give you an example it, it just helps you to visualize some of the choices that you might have what this bar shows on the left hand side is the um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with a lamb tikka masala which is just over six kilograms a corn tikka masala which is 730 grams and a chickpea tikka masala which is 600 grams 10 times lower than the lamb tikka masala and she she breaks it down in a lot of detail and she does lots and lots of different um things here are examples this shows you that a latte particularly if it uses dairy milk has got a huge footprint and um so uh again this shows some different scenarios of, of a, an average breakfast that people eat in the world what a high emissions breakfast might look like and what a low emissions book um breakfast might look like and she does this she, there's a whole series of chapters and it covers all sorts of different meals and it's extremely educational and i would encourage you to take a look um, and just a couple of information sites so the nhs talk about um, that they have a uh, advice about um, eating plant-based so there's a, a link that i can share for anyone as i mentioned um, there is the plant plant-based health professionals is is hundreds of UK medical doctors who, who effectively are helping to educate about plant-based diets. They have some absolutely brilliant materials on their websites, plantbasedhealthprofessionals.com, including fact sheets for people who are pregnant, 
or for um, young young babies or children um, and also for adults and they explain things really really clearly um, and they're medical doctors so they understand absolutely the importance of nutrients and, and things so I would highly recommend if you do consider that you want to start to shift your diet by all means um, it's really important just to learn a little bit about um, the health aspects and just little things to consider to make sure you, you've got a good varied diet um, and there's a fantastic couple of phone apps, uh, Chronometer or My Fitness Pal, that you could actually just for a few days enter the food that you eat and it will tell you how you're doing against, uh, it tells you if you're having too much or too little salt or too much or too little protein and it goes through all of the different things and helps guide you. So I, doing it every day is probably time consuming, but I do it periodically and it's just a good reminder to check that you, you know, you, you're not forgetting anything. Um, Again, fantastic podcasts called Nutrition Rounds, all about the subject. Dr. Bellardo is a cardiologist, so again, a medical doctor who interviews people and explains about the health aspects of, of diet change. And this is Dr. Joseph Poor, who said, for a typical average consumer, diet change isn't just the single biggest way to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, your land use, your impact on biodiversity, the nitrogen phosphorus pollution caused by your food, the acid rain, the water use, but probably the pesticide and antibiotic use that is caused by the food system. So thank you. I, I, I do apologize for going over because some new research came out this week. I did, um, I did uh, add one or two bits and pieces, but these slides are available. There's actually nearly twice as many slides in the pack if you request the additional slides. So if you if you wouldn't mind, I'd be extremely grateful if you would um, use this link uh, to um, just provide a bit of feedback and you can tick to request a copy of, of the slides, which will we'll all have all of the sources in there and you'll get the bonus slides thrown in for good measure. So thank you very much for listening this evening. Anthony, I'm absolutely stunned. Just a massive thank you for a very informative extremely thorough and thought-provoking talk. I presume, Michelle, you've unmuted everybody. Okay. So, everyone, you can unmute yourselves now, or Michelle will unmute you all. Yeah, I, unmute if you want to. It's quite interesting. I, I, I couldn't see this screen, so uh, I... It's, I'm just quite relieved there is still somebody in the room come the end of it. <laughs> can we now stop recording so people can yeah. put themselves back on their um, image and